Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part five of my series on the selected gross pathology of the nervous system. We've already had a full lecture on viral agents, another lecture on bacterial agents, and in this lecture, I want to cover the rest of the infectious agents that might find their way into the central nervous system. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who have provided me these great images over the years, which allow me to put this lecture together. Let's start with some fungal agents. Of all the dimorphic fungi, those that are mycelial in nature and in their yeast form within tissue, the one that is most famous for infecting the central nervous system in a range of species is Cryptococcus neoformans. This is a classic picture from the brain of a cat. And if you look closely, you can see these sort of punched out holes within the gray, to a lesser extent, the white matter. These are foci of minimal granulominous information and large number of yeasts. They have a soap bubble appearance underneath the microscope because one of the protective mechanisms the cryptococcus has is the production of a mucinous capsule which keeps the inflammatory cells which want to destroy them at arm's length. There's a lot of mucin in this capsule and so you can put a special stain called a mucicarmine in it and you will see it outlined in pink. Whenever we process these tissue, remember that that capsule is going to contract down. So instead of having um, a large red area, you're going to have a very small red area and the white around it is actually retraction artifact. That does confuse a lot of people. There's another virulence factor that Cryptococcus has to prevent its destruction in the central nervous system. And that's its ability to utilize catecholamines from the surrounding tissue and turn that into a melanin-like substance that is protective against oxidative damage and also helps to convince the immune system that the fungus belongs there because there's always a lot of melanin in the central nervous system as, as many of the cells are derived from the neural tube from which all melanin containing cells come. While it used to be that immunosuppressed animals, at least cats and people, were most susceptible to Cryptococcus neoformans, there are now variants of Cryptococcus neoformans which can infect immunocompetent animals. Cryptococcus neoformans variant Gattii is one that will go after an immunocompetent animal, whereas the true neoformans variant neoformans and neoformans variant Grubii tend uh, to go after animals who have an immune uh, suppressed immune system. Uh, to that effect, uh, about 25% of AIDS patients, uh, human patients with acquired immune deficiency syndrome, will develop cryptococcosis within the brain and the formation of large tumor-like lesions, which are known as cryptococcomas. If you've ever seen the movie Philadelphia, a phenomenal story um, about a lawyer with AIDS played by Tom Hanks, one of the uh, diseases that he develops as part of his uh, illness is a cryptococcoma. There are two ways that uh, the that cryptococcus gets into the brain. It can certainly get into the brain uh, through the blood vessels. Um, but what might be more common in both cats and horses is uh, extension through the cribriform plate. Cryptococcus, uh, especially in the cat, the cats will get many lesions around their nose and they will develop a, a rhinitis sinusitis. And that infection can eat through the cribriform plate infecting the olfactory lobes and uh, the forebrain. The source of most hematogenous infections 
is probably uh, a pulmonary infection. Another common location, or maybe the most common location, for cryptococcal infections. Uh, these, this particular agent will really infect many different species, often through respiratory channels. Remember, a lot of these uh, dimorphic fungi are spread by uh, inhaling mycelia, often in nitrogenous ways, such as the excreta of bats or certain types of birds. Just one other thing, I generally default to uh, the term granulomatous or pyogranulomatous when I think about all of the dimorphic fungi. Some tend to, uh, to recruit a lot more neutrophils. Uh, the lesion in the brain of the cat is always one you have to scratch your head over because there is so little inflammation. But if there is any, it is granulomatous. So I, so I tend to call this uh, multifocal coalescing granulomatous encephalitis. Let's look at one more of the uh, of the dimorphic fungi and you can see all of these fungi in just about any uh, organ of the body. This is another cat, great picture by Brian Caserto when he was at Kansas State University uh, and this is a granulomatous meningitis. I can't really tell you if it is an encephalitis. They often are um, due to histoplasma capsulatum, another dimorphic fungus that's uh, commonly seen in certain parts of the country, especially the uh, uh, Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. Uh, this dimorphic fungi tends to accumulate within macrophages in multiple organs. The brain is not a very common site. The lungs, the liver, the spleen are, but obviously if you are an intracellular fungus in a macrophage, that macrophage decides to go on a walk about in the bloodstream, you could end up just about anywhere. And these dimorphic fungi have the ability to replicate within macrophages so they can result in destruction, liberation, and an infection is seated in another uh, organ. So these are often multi-organ infections. The eyes are not uncommonly affected in these animals. You may have skin infections, bone, just about anywhere. With histoplasma, the other dimorphic fungi, blastomyces, dermatitis and if you live on the west coast anywhere from california down now through central america uh, you could become infected with uh, coccidiomycosis another the largest of the dimorphic fungi so dimorphic fungi not too uncommon in the central nervous system here's another fungus and it's very interesting that these that cats and horses seem to be overrepresented in uh, CNS infections with fungi. When I think about the CNS, let's not forget that we are talking about the brain, the central nervous system, but also the back part of the eye, the retina is also part of the central nervous system. And this is a fungus that occasionally you will see in cats in the eye as well. Um, the first thing that you should probably notice about this focus of granulomatous inflammation and necrosis in the brainstem is the discoloration. This is another cat, and it has been infected by one of over a hundred species of what are known as dermatiaceous fungi. These are fungi that produce a melanin-like pigment probably also serves as a virulence factor, at least a protective mechanism, especially when you are in the brain. Dermatiaceous fungi in cats and horses, when you clump them all together, they've, been, they've gone by many different names. Um, the syndrome is known as pheohyphomycosis. And if you don't see it in the central nervous system, you'll most likely encounter it as a cutaneous infection, especially in horses, but also in cats through introduction through a traumatic wound. There are, as I said, a hundred different species of these, most that I will never hear of. Some of the ones that you hear of on a fairly regular basis 
include Cladosporium or Cladiophila fora bantiana, Cladosporium trichoides, and Xylohypha. But there are many different types, and sometimes it's easier just to call the syndrome pheohyphomycosis, and everybody knows what to uh, uh, what you're talking about. It's not exclusive to cats and horses. It's also be, has been seen in uh, cattle and goats as well. I don't want to, uh, I certainly don't want to short the uh, poultry on fungus in the central nervous system. Occasionally poultry will turn up with fungi within the central nervous system, often forming granulomas within the cerebrum. Uh, there are two main types that you probably should be familiar with. In young animals, especially those who have suffered from brooder pneumonias or being raised in uh, unclean brooders, these tend to grow a variety of fungi of the genera of the genus Aspergillus. Aspergillus fumigatus to be the most common and occasionally in sick animals the hyphae of Aspergillus fumigatus will get out of the air sacs and the lungs. Hyphae are great for causing vasculitis. They often invade the bloodstream and as such they can travel throughout the body and rarely you can set up an Aspergillus infection within the cerebrum. Usually seen in younger animals and there is a history in the flock of brooder pneumonia or other aspergillus infections. Another one that often likes to go the cerebellum, but you can see it in the cerebrum as well, is a fungus I learned as Dactylaria gallipavo. Um, gallipavo is usually seen in association with turkeys. Um, but now I believe has been renamed to Ochraconus gallipavo. Uh, it is another neurotropic fungus, more neurotropic than Aspergillus, and you can imagine the size that you would see in affected birds. Uh, they would show significant neurologic signs, uh, depression be obtunded. The things that we see that are associated with encephalitis uh, in any animal species, once again, I tend to default to pyogranulomas, not in birds, uh, but pyogranulomas inflammation for most fungal infections in most species in birds, I would just go straight granulomas because they don't form pus as we've talked about before. And here's another case of hemorrhage and necrosis due to ochroconus infection in a turkey. Okay, let's move on to some protozoal diseases that may end up in the brain or the spinal cord. A very important protozoal disease that will affect the spinal cord of horses is called equine protozoal myeloencephalitis and is usually associated with an apicomplexin known as sarcocystis neurona. There are a couple of other possibilities of AB complexin on which will cause identical lesions, although far less frequently. Neospora huzi and Neospora caninum have also been identified. Neospora caninum um, will cause very similar lesions in the dog and in cattle as well. When we talk about sarcocystis neurona, this disease is most common in younger horses with a breed predilection for thoroughbreds, quarter horses, and standard breds, which are mostly the most of the common breeds that we see here in the U.S. Horses are considered dead end hosts. They may act as intermediate hosts and simply carry the cysts. Uh, within uh, skeletal muscle, um, as you might see in a number of wild or domestic herbivores. 
in a, uh, in a number of cases, the cysts get into an aberrant site, which is generally the spinal cord. where it infects uh, both neurons and glial cells and some inflammatory cells that might migrate, my, might migrate in. It's very difficult without the use of immunohistochemistry to tell exactly what cell contains the large uh, cysts of Sarcosystis neurona. The definitive host for this parasite is uh, the North American and South American possums. And they, uh, it is a enteric cycle, and they will shed this in the feces. You can see the cysts both in the gray and the white matter. The hemorrhage that is seen is sort of unusual because the, the, uh, uh, the parasitic cysts usually have no, uh, they're, they're not in conjunction with vessels. The, the AB complexin could care less about endothelial. There are some forms of sarcosystis like endothelium, but not this one. And so you often see hemorrhage, and the cause of that hemorrhage is somewhat unknown. Sarcosystis neurona, as well as Neospora caninum, I've always found to be uh, not difficult to find in most cases, but usually you see a large cyst which is well confined into a neuron or maybe a macrophage and there's these large areas of hemorrhage and necrosis and uh, so I've never understood why just a couple of cysts can cause all this necrosis but it certainly happens. Um, in terms of clinical signs uh, these are usually slowly developing diseases in the horse um, they will present initially with asymmetric ataxia, primarily in the hind limbs, um, and then focal motor muscle atrophy as a result of uh, the death of lower motor neurons within the spinal cord. Um, the hemorrhage and the necrosis that you see uh, cannot be characterized to either the white matter, like you might see with herpes virus in the horse, or the gray matter, as you might see with the West Nile virus. It's one of those that really doesn't care, gray or white. So when you have lesions in both gray and white matter, it's something that you should be considering. I would like to say that all cases of sarcosis neurona or in the dog, Neospora caninum, always have uh, the agent or readily that are that's readily visible unfortunately Neospora usually has quite a few uh, Sarcosystis neurona uh, I've seen quite a number of cases that they were only identified on immuno of multiple sections or PCR here is a large abscess in the brain of a non-human primate. You can tell as we talked before because the cerebellum is tucked down below. This could be a human, this could even be uh, one of a number of uh, a reptile species, but it's a focal area of a large area of necrosis, abscessation, and this is what, this is, what is seen with entamoeba species. Entamoeba uh, is a uh, amoeba, as you would expect, it's a protozoan. In humans and non-human primates, the most important species is Entamoeba histolytica, and in reptiles, it is Entamoeba invadens, usually carried by turtles and spread to other species, but will affect a wide range of reptilian species. Pathogenesis is, is largely the same in all of these species. Um, it is not an uncommon uh, commensal in the enteron of non-human primates. For some reason, when there is a, a disturbance in bacterial flora, such as the animal is uh, given antibiotics, uh, antifungals, or is immunosuppressed, those normal commensals, which live in the intestine and which eat bacteria, um, they will migrate into the wall of the 
intestine. Uh, in certain species of non-human primates, they live in the stomach. These are the, the colobus monkeys who are leaf-eating monkeys with large rumen-like saccular stomachs in which um, um, the entamoeba is part of that flora. But most of the other species, uh, they're present in the intestine, sometimes the colon. So when something within the lumen becomes uh, unfriendly toward them, they will move into the wall. And the issue with a variance with most of the uh, amoeba or amoeba-like protozoans, like histomonas, is that they secrete a very powerful exotoxin, which is acts much like a perforin. It punches holes in the membranes of the cells around it very indiscriminately. And they'll start out in the wall of the intestine. They will make a large ulcer, often a volcano ulcer, it is narrow at the top, a little hole that they get into, and as they get deeper, they spread wider and wider. That's why we call them volcano ulcers. Eventually, if you're in the intestine and you're making a hole in the wall, you're going to get into the portal system and be swept along to the liver. So many of these animals will deliver, will also uh, develop liver abscesses. Very common in people. In people, they tend to develop a single uh, amoebic abscess in one lobe. Uh, in non-human primates, it tends to be a more disseminated uh, process in the liver. But once you're in the bloodstream, there's nothing that says you have to go to the liver. You can float away to any organ that you want. You will see these uh, amoeba within the lungs. And every once in a while, you will see them get into the brain. And they are just as happy to secrete their perforins up there. You'll have a lot of necrosis, neutrophils, and you'll end up with a large uh, amoebic abscesses. In reptiles, it seems to be um, much more devastating within the intestine and liver, and maybe they never get to the point, but you can always see amoeba anywhere in these infected animals of any species. This is an absolutely fantastic picture by Alex Loretti. Um, of a very pink brain. And when you think about uh, pink brains, you want to think about parasites of erythrocytes. This particular behavior of, of se sequestration of erythrocytes within the capillaries of many organs, including the brain, is seen with a number of intraerythrocytic parasites. In this particular case, we're looking at the brain of an ox with Babesia bovis, but a similar uh, behavior has been seen in a number of species of plasmodium, which cause malaria as well. Uh, the evolutionary impetus is that when the uh, erythrocyte is infected, the presence of bacteria and the change of the antigens make it very appealing to macrophages throughout the body, especially in the spleen. And so if they circulate, they are very likely to be engulfed by macrophages in the spleen or other organs such as the liver taken out of circulation. That's the end of the parasite. Um, these parasites have developed a way to upregulate adhesion molecules. So the erythrocyte will adhere to the wall of vessels throughout the body. This results in this very distinctive color change in the brain, which is normally white, and the tremendous congestion and the sequestration, the, adher the adherence of these erythrocytes to the wall give it a characteristic pink appearance. All over the world, this is known as pink brain. So when you see pink brain, I want you to think of, at least in cattle, uh, you want to think of babesiosis. Uh, in primates, you want to think, uh, think of uh, plasmodium. Uh, this particular picture comes to us from uh, Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, Bovine babesiosis is caused by Babesia bovis, used to be uh, Babesia argentina, and is transmitted by ticks. It is frequently life-threatening and associated with jaundice and hemoglobinuria, 
Uh, and if that doesn't kill it, the animals will develop a severe anemia as well. Approximately two-thirds of the cattle um, in southern Brazil uh, will develop severe clinical signs and may die. It's not considered a, a severe disease in many, many of the other parts of the world. It's seen in southern Texas, it's seen uh, in Africa, but in Brazil it seems to be a much more virulent in uh, especially young cattle around, the, around a year of age. Um, I did mention malaria. Malaria is seen in quite a number of species of non-human primates. It will cause a similar lesion. Cerebral malaria is one of the manifestations. We generally talk about malaria when we talk about hepatic disease, splenic disease, and uh, diseases of the blood. So I'm not going to cover it. This was a interesting and very old picture of uh, one of the manifestations of malaria in llamas. Uh, it's really not malaria, it's mycoplasmosis. Um, mycoplasma hemolamae can cause necrotic lesions within the brain of affected llama. And I just throw that in there. It's an unusual, it's the only picture I have of it, but really nice lesion. Okay, let's move on to some nematodes. You don't think about nematodes in the brain. You don't want to think about worms in the brain. That is the stuff of uh, horror movies. But we're going to cover a couple of common ones. Um, the brain, no, no worm grows up and says, really, I want to live in the brain. Maybe one or two, but uh, usually when you find them there, it is aberrant migration. But there are a couple of helminth parasites that we want to talk about that uh, can be a little more routinely found in the brain. One of the, uh, one of the parasites that uh, you want to think about in horses with neurologic lesions is a parasite known as Halocephalobus gingivalis. It used to be called Halocephalobus uh, delatrix, um, but now it's gingivalis, which goes back to uh, one of the portals of entry and that is uh, uh, within the mouth, and it will cause gingival lesions. This is a, a very interesting parasite that lives in de decaying plant matter. There isn't a real uh, vector for this, not ticks or flies or whatever. The animal comes in contact with the decaying plant matter, whether it lays in it, whether it dabbles its lips in it, and the uh, female uh, worms never seen a male in tissue. There are males; they're free living in nature, um, but the females get into the mouth. They start in the oral cavity, um, but they can also enter through other mucous membranes, including those of the prepuce or the genitalia, which helps to explain some infections in the the furthermost part back of the body. But uh, many come in through the oral cavity, and they travel in perivascular areas. They don't travel, they travel uh, right up along the vessels and they will routinely get into a number of tissues, uh, one of which is the brain. Uh, here you can see there's granulomatous inflammation causing distortion of the hypothalamus. Uh, you can also see them along the optic nerves. They tend to end up in the bottom of the brain, but these lesions can extend up into the forebrain as well. Other common spots that you will see them uh, include the kidneys and the adrenals, although you can really see them in just about any organ. Um, as I said before, you'll never see the males. The females have a very characteristic tripartite esophagus, with a corpus, an isthmus, and a bulb. And then the areas of granulomatous inflammation where you see the female worms, there are usually large numbers of larvae uh, which are in that as well. So this is Halocephalobus gingivalis. We've mentioned it in the lectures on the horse, uh, and I think I mentioned the lecture on the kidney. It causes a very characteristic lesion in the horse kidney. Well, everybody's at risk 
for this next uh, helminth parasite of the uh, brain. Uh, actually, this one will go everywhere. This is a cause of visceral larval migraines um, due to a raccoon roundworm called Bayless ascaris procyonis. Procyonis meaning from the raccoon. Now, stories of visceral larval migraines from roundworms of any type of roundworm uh, are not uncommon. The dog roundworm can cause visceral larval migraines in the dog. It can also cause it in people. You can get cutaneous tracts. This is why your mother told you never go out barefoot. Um, one of the problems is that in young children, they tend to migrate widely because the, uh, the larval forms of any roundworm will, will migrate, cause minimal problems in the natural host, more significant problems in the aberrant host. Um, and in small children, they can migrate into the central nervous system, causing brain lesions or retinal lesions. Um, but the worst of all is uh, Bayless ascaris procyonis, because in addition to migrating widely and having a tropism for the uh, central nervous system, this worm will grow. It will shed its cuticle. It will continue to grow, whereas most of your migrating uh, ascarid larvae don't grow. This will grow significantly. The tracks that it leaves as it migrates through the brain are very significant. And so we see uh, acute and profound neurologic disease in a wide range of species that have come in contact with raccoon feces and ingested the eggs. Um, raccoons are latrine users. You can, they often use the same spot over and over. You can see it often at the base of a tree in between two roots. You can see it commonly on old houses that have raccoons in the attic, not only within the attic, but also along the eaves or on the roof, and they all go in the same spot. So you get this tremendous collection, and especially if it's in the roof or in the gutter, it washes down. And so we have to be very careful uh, pretty much every species has had uh, neurologic disease associated with this everywhere from uh, anything from birds to rabbits to uh, to man and it is a significant problem we have seen a number of cases um, from the uh, dog center down in Texas um, in our military working dogs whether they get them uh, when they uh, when they are deployed or maybe they're local but raccoon control is extremely important and if you have raccoons in your attic um, it is a good thing to move them along trap them release them in the wild and be very careful while you're working in that attic to stay away from their feces because they may be contaminated or they may be uh, harboring Bayless ascaris Cestodes. Cestodes will occasionally get into the brain, and one that is a classic condition in sheep is a disease called GID, or G-I-D, also known as sturdy. Um, many of the helminth parasites have two names. Uh, they have a name for the larval stage and a name for the adult stage. Uh, this has been called many the larval stage, which are large space occupying senuri, uh, has gone by a number of names. It is currently known as Senurus cerebralis. Um, this is the larval stage because the sheep is the intermediate host for tenia multiceps, in which the definitive host is the dog. It should be readily apparent the neurologic disease is significant due to everything from cerebral edema, hydrocephalus, and just destruction of the brain tissue of the sheep. They may get so large that you can have destruction of the overlying skull bone as well. Another helminth parasite that occasionally gets into the brain of a number of species is 
uh, Tania Solium, a whose adult host is the human. So this is a, a tapeworm of humans. The immature form is Cystocircus cellulosi, most commonly seen within the skeletal muscles of pigs. You can also see it in dogs as well. Primarily causes granulomous inflammation uh, within skeletal muscle, uh, especially of the jaws and the, the metabolically active muscles of pigs. Every once in a while in the intermediate host and occasionally in the uh, definitive host, you can see cystocerci that get loose and they get into other uh, organs such as the brain. It is always a good idea to uh, cook your pig meat. Um, if you're eating pork, cook it well. Uh, chances are that uh, you're buying it from the grocery store. You would not uh, ever come in contact with something like this. But in certain parts of the developing world, this is an extremely common parasite. Um, you're very likely to encounter it by uh, encountering, unfortunately, human fecal contamination as well. But you can get it from pork, so make sure that you, you cook your pork products uh, especially well. A couple of other helminth parasites um, that just accidentally get into the uh, uh, central nervous system. Not the best picture, but you can see this large red worm. This is Spirocerca lupi. Remember, Spirocerca lupi migrates through the, uh, the aortic adventitia in the esophagus. It generally ends up in the esophagus and the wall to cause a granuloma. But these uh, uh, particular worms have notoriously bad directional skills. They often will end up aberrantly in uh, uh, the periosteum of the vertebra. This one actually got in between the vertebral bodies and penetrated the, uh, the spinal canal. Um, there is, and it reminds me, there is a very interesting helminth parasite of South America called Gertia paralysans, in which the larval form uh, has a tropism for the spinal cord, and in cats will cause uh, paresis and paralysis due to larval granulomas within the spinal cord. So this is this is another Spirocerca lupi. You can tell it's a big red spirurids. The spirurids have a brightly eosinophilic or red uh, fluid within their coelom, gives them a red appearance, and this one just ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, well we're winding down this lecture, and one other uncommon cause of disease in the uh, central nervous system is that which is caused by arthropods. In this case, usually the maggots or bots of flies are the ones that we are concerned with and a classic disease identified by doctors Alexander De La Hunta and John King up in Cornell maybe about 40 years ago now is uh, ischemic myel uh, encephalopathy, excuse me, ischemic encephalopathy in the cat. It is the a disease which causes an acute onset of unilateral or sometimes bilateral neurologic signs, usually in late summer or early fall, uh, when cuterebra, uh, a type of fly, um, is prevalent in temperate areas. Um, we're looking at the brain of a cat, and you can see one side is somewhat deflated uh, in the middle. It is This is the uh, area supplied by the middle cerebral artery. For some reason, the lesions usually appear in this particular area. And it is the result of nasal migration of cuterebra. Cuterebra emasculator is a fly that normally lays eggs in open wounds. Um, and then the, the wound will heal, the uh, larva will grow underneath the skin. Uh, eventually, it will cause a hole in the skin where it can breathe through, through its spiracles. Eventually, it will 
uh, drop out on the ground when it reaches a particular size and pupate. Um, and then it will turn into an adult fly. Uh, it is thought that in cats, uh, the fly will mistake the, the nares for a wound and will lay the uh, egg in the area of the nose. And if that egg hatches, the larva migrates up the nose, causes a rhinitis, a sinusitis, and may actually migrate through these, the cribriform plate into the brain. Um, in affected animals, you have ischemic damage in the area of supply of the middle cerebral artery. The cause is actually unknown. It could be a prolonged vasospasm, uh, possibly caused by a production, maybe a toxin from the larva itself. In acute stages, you see severe vasculitis with thrombosis and hemorrhage. Uh, more chronic lesions would be what you expect after significant ischemic damage. The animals will often, uh, they, they will circle toward the side of the lesion. Um, if they uh, have bilateral lesions, I, I guess they either circle one way or the other, or maybe they walk straight. I'm not sure. But this particular disease uh, had been recognized for a long time up at Cornell. And I can't remember, it involved both men, whether John King finally finding one of the cuterebra within the brain pan of, of one of these cats interrupted Dr. Della Hunter's uh, class with a dead cat in one hand and a cuterebra in the other, or it was vice versa, and Dr. Del Hunter was the first. But uh, I'm sure that it was a, a red-letter day for both of them, confirming a long-held suspicion that this was due to uh, migrating arthropods. This is a case that is not from a cat. This is actually from a sheep, but a similar problem is rarely seen in sheep infected with the bot of the fly Estrus ovis. Once again, these, these eggs are laid uh, in the nares. The larva will migrate. It will set up shop in the, uh, uh, in the nose of the affected sheep. They don't like it. They snuffle and they snarfle and, and whatever. Eventually, they will develop into a pupa and drop back out. Um, but every once in a while, you get one that finds its way through the cribriform plate and gets up into the brain where, where it will cause significant neurologic damage. So I wish I had a nice picture of cuterebra, but here's something that's very similar. Estrus ovus within the skull of a sheep. Well, 45 minutes, not too bad to cover fungi and protozoa and worms and bugs. So I appreciate you hanging in there. Our next lecture is going to be a, a lecture where we're going to group some agents. Again, we're going to cover the nutritional diseases, the metabolic diseases, and the toxicologic diseases affecting the central nervous system in our next lecture. So I hope you come back for that one. I appreciate you hanging in for, with me today for 45 minutes. As always, I wish you a fantastic day in wonderful health, and I will see you next time.